I have a thought that's been on my mind for a long time. So it's what I'm going to pass on to you tonight. I realized that a lot of the stuff that I preach here is actually kind of repetitive. I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And if that bothers you, I am terribly sorry. But I'm bringing to you what I feel like God wants me to bring. Um, so that's my first worry for tonight. My second worry for tonight is I understand what this means, what, what I'm going to talk about. I understand what it means to me. I'm afraid I'm going to fail to get across to you what it means to me. And uh, of course that is nobody's fault but my own. It's definitely not the word of God's fault. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'd like to start with prayer because I want to do my best. And I want to somehow get across to you something that has affected me. And this is the only way I know how to do that. So if you bow your heads with me. Lord, your word is great and you are good. I ask you to be with us tonight. I know you are going to help me. Help me to be clear. And help me to get across the thought that you have laid on my heart, Lord Jesus, in the best possible way. We thank you again for your goodness and your mercy. And I know that you are going to be with us, Lord Jesus, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. The thought I'm going to bring to you tonight is something that... Uh, Brother Jones Woods planted in my head. So blame him. It's all his fault. But it really changed how I prayed for myself and my family. So I'm going to try to get it across to you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See that in verse 2? He said, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. He said, you, Abraham, the people that come from you, your descendants, they'll be a blessing. This is the promise of Abraham. This is what makes the Jews God's chosen people. The God who cannot lie and cannot fail made this promise to Abraham and it is still in effect today and that's why the Jews still exist as a people 2,000 years after their homeland was destroyed there is not one culture in existence that has lasted for 2,000 years after their homeland was destroyed you will not find ancient Babylonians wandering the earth you will not find ancient Romans in little enclaves or ancient Greeks. You'll find people who may call themselves that, but they don't resemble the actual ancient Romans or ancient Greeks. But the Jews have had an unbroken lineage for 2,000 years without a homeland. Why? Because they've got a promise. God has kept them. God has sustained them. And in 1948, God returned to them a homeland that had been gone for almost 2,000 years. You want to talk about a fulfillment of prophecy. Over and over in the Old Testament, God said, I'm going to return you to the land from which you come. And people, they, they hadn't had a land. So people invented all kinds of doctrines to explain 
how those could be true and yet the Jews not have a homeland. Well, they should have just waited until 1948. Because God had a plan and a purpose. And yeah, he waited a couple thousand years. But he gave them back their land that he had promised them from the beginning. This promise that he gave Abraham has been true. Nations that curse the Jews have been cursed. Do you know in the 15th century that Spain was a major world power? In fact, it was probably the major world power. And it's a hard thing for, for me to grasp. May not necessarily, well, I, I bet you it's, it's pretty difficult for all of us to grasp because for all of our lives, Spain's kind of been a backwater European country, almost third world in and of itself. Their ships ruled the Spanish main, the American continents. I, I studied this today. They brought over five billion, or excuse me, five hundred billion dollars worth of silver and gold and Asian trade products to Europe. And this is back in the day when, you know, a billion dollars actually meant something. They were the wealthiest nation in Europe on the face of the earth. And you'd think that would have guaranteed them a place in history. Or excuse me, a, a permanent place in the world order. A permanent status of power. But by the 18th century, they're a joke. They're a laughing stock. Oh, they exist. But their power is gone. Their wealth is fading. Why? Something else happened in 1492 that we don't often hear about. It's called the, the Alhambra Decree. Ferdinand and Isabella, they not only funded Columbus, but they sent out the Alhambra Decree, which declared that every single Jew in the nation of Spain had to get out or die. 800,000 Jews were forced from their homes. They were not allowed to take any money with them. Tens of thousands died trying to flee. Why is Spain a joke, a laughing stock? They cursed God's people. God cursed them. You can argue with me, you can dispute with me, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly what happened. You look at the wealth and the power that they had, and you could never imagine that they would be where they are today. In just a matter of 300 years. It seems like a long time to us, but it's, it's really not on the world stage. They're coming around, though. In 1992, the Spanish king apologized for the expulsion. And now, uh, Sephardic Jews, which are Jews that came from Spain, can become Spanish citizens without ever having left, lived there. And they're the only nation in the world where this can happen other than Israel. In other words, they're reaching out to those that they expelled. I suspect that if God tarries that the blessings of God will begin to return to Spain because they have turned their eyes back to God's people. Of course, we all know the nation of Germany. They cursed God's people worse than the Spanish did. And they paid. Well, brother, they're still on the world stage. Yes, and every single one of their leaders has had to beg forgiveness from the Jewish people. They've paid over... I believe, if I remember correctly, over $150 billion of reparations. In other words, they cursed them at one point, but they're now trying to bless them, make, make restitution for what they've done. How about nations that have blessed the Jews? There was a little uh, backwater country in Europe, which was kind of a joke back in the day. Uh, in the year 1290, they expelled their Jews. But you know what happened in the year 1655? They had, a, they had a little bit of a revolution. And the new leaders welcomed the Jews back. And it wasn't long after that before England began its rise to what some could call world domination. 
Maybe they never ruled an empire that covered the globe, but their economic power was unrivaled. Their navy was unmatched. This little tiny country, maybe a tenth of the size of some of the bigger ones in Europe, literally dominated European politics. How could that be? They blessed God's people. And God blessed them. Why has America been blessed? Because we welcomed them when other people were kicking them out. We allowed them to worship freely and we didn't persecute them. And when the nation of Israel was reborn, we supported them. We've blessed God's people and in turn God has blessed us. But the blessing that God gave Abraham said, Abraham, you will be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So how were all the families of the earth blessed in Abraham? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It's very simple. Matthew 1, 1 simply says this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus is part of that family of Abraham. And in Jesus, the whole world is blessed. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. I'll give Joel a moment to get there. Galatians 4, we're going to go down through verse 7. God chose to send a blessing to the world and the family of Abraham is how he did it. That's the vehicle, the, the channel that he chose to use. Therefore, you are no longer, oh, excuse me, Galatians 4.4. 4. Back up to verse 4, please. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How are all the families of the earth blessed? We can be adopted into God's family through Christ. We can become an heir of God through Jesus. Go back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Because this promise is extended to everybody. This promise is open to the whole world. This is not a promise to just Abraham's physical descendants, the Jews. It's open to everybody. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In God, there's no distinction between any of us, between Jew or Gentile, between slave or free, between male or female. We're all Abraham's seed in his eyes through Christ. We're all part of that promise. It's open to the whole world. We're all, you must, we're all part of that promise. How did Jesus bless all the families of the world? First one is very, very obvious. <laughs> he took away our sins. He brought us into a relationship with God. The spiritual things that he did, did that no one else could do. That blessed all the families of the earth. But you know what? He was more than just that. He brought blessings to every... No one could come into the presence of Jesus without a chance to be blessed. No one could stand before the physical Jesus when he walked this earth and leave the same way they came. Everybody had an opportunity to walk away different. What kind of things did he do? Well, he healed the sick. You could come to him sick and walk away well. You know, he also he fed the hungry. We don't focus on that a whole lot, but he fed the hungry. He blessed them with a free meal. They liked it so much they wanted to stick around and have him feed them all the time. He had to start chasing them away. It's 
Some of the things that Jesus asked us to do, we don't have examples of him doing, but he asked us to do them. In uh, Matthew 25, starting with verse 34, it's a familiar passage of scripture. Matthew 25 and verse 34. Uh, here Jesus is, he's, he's given a parable as he was wont to do, and he said, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Jesus, we've never seen you in any of these situations. What are you talking about? And he answered, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. So here he starts talking about some other things. He said we should be clothing those that don't have proper clothing. So we should be giving shelter to those that don't have a home. So we should be visiting the sick and the imprisoned. If you read through the Gospels, you find that he also called for people to give to the poor. And he gave himself. But he did some other things too. He blessed people in other ways. Not just with physical healing or touching physical hunger or clothing people that needed clothes or visiting people that needed visiting. He touched some needs and he blessed people in ways that can't be quantified. I, I've used this before, but this, this, it speaks to me. I don't, we won't read it tonight, but in, in Matthew chapter 8, a leper came to him and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. But what speaks to me, and I've spoken on this before, and I, just, I can't help it. It, it, it. it may not mean anything to you, but it means something to me. The Bible says that Jesus reached out and touched him. And then he said, I'm willing to be clean. So before the healing power had ever flown, before the healing power had cleansed that man, Jesus touched him. And that may not mean a whole lot to you, but this is a man who has not been touched by another human being possibly for years. He's had to go through life making sure that nobody touches him. His own family can't even be around him. And the first thing he, that Jesus does is not heal him. The first thing that Jesus does is touch him. Why? Because there was a need that went beyond that sickness of his body. He needed somebody. He needed some human contact. He needed somebody to touch him, to have physical contact with him, to let him know, you're part of the human race. You matter. You're important. And that was before Jesus healed him. He met that man's emotional need before he ever healed his physical body. He dealt with people's guilt. Uh, Matthew 9, they, they brought a paralytic to him. And the first thing he said was not get up and walk. The first thing he said is, son, your sins be forgiven you. I suspect that the most pressing need in that paralytic man was not that physical healing. I suspect this is a man that was eaten up with guilt and eaten up with condemnation. So the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth dealt with the most immediate need. You're forgiven. Then after we've gotten that out of the way, now get up and walk. He dealt with needs like loneliness. He told his disciples in uh, Matthew 28, 20, he said, I'm with you always. John 14 and 18, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You are never alone. He valued people. He told them who they were and how important they were to God. He 
he said that in Luke 12, he said, you're more important than many sparrows. He said, God takes care of them. You're more important than they are. Why would God fail to take care of you? Later in that chapter, he said, look at the lilies of the field. They're beautiful, aren't they? God clothes them. You're more important than the lilies of the field. Why would God not? take care of you. You're more important. When you look at the vastness of this world and, and the beauty of creation, do you not understand that in God's eyes, you're a thousand million times more beautiful than anything on the face of this earth? You can stand before the grandeur of the Grand Canyon, and God would still choose you. Because you're valuable to him. And, and Jesus understood that. And he valued people. He let them know you're important. He accepted those that nobody else would accept. Let's go here. Matthew 9. We'll go ahead and read this one. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples and when the religious people saw it when, 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 the, when the guys that went to the temple every Sabbath when, when the guys that prayed on the street corner saw it when, when the people who were supposed to be the closest to God saw what Jesus was doing they said why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners Jesus responded, those are, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he responded, those are the ones that need me. He accepted. Tax collectors and sinners, they weren't going to be in a Pharisee's house. They weren't going to have the minister shake their hand. They weren't going to be welcome where good people got together. I'm sorry, but you're not welcome in this house. And Jesus said, no, 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 let them come. He accepted those that society would not accept. Every single person coming into the presence of Jesus had a chance to be blessed. Had a chance to be touched. Had a chance to be changed. Had a chance to be healed. Didn't matter their social standing or their position. Didn't matter their education or lack thereof. It didn't matter if they were sick or well. Didn't matter if they were rich or poor. It didn't matter if they were perfumed or smelly. He was there for all of them. I would love to have been there when Jesus was walking this earth. Because you know, he's not doing that anymore. Not in a physical body that we can see. He ascended into heaven. Well, then how can people be blessed how can the people be blessed because we still need a blessing here today in our culture in our nation in our county in our city we need to be blessed this is where I make the leap and I hope you follow along with me 1 Corinthians 12 27 Jesus' physical body is not here this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. You're the hands of Jesus, whether you realize it or not. You're the face of Christ, whether you accept that or not, you are. So I have a question for you. Are the people coming into your presence blessed? Do they leave you better than when they got there? All the families of the earth are blessed through Christ's spiritual body. Us. If we continued on in 1 Corinthians, we'd find it talking about the different parts of the body. How everybody has a different place. And to me, what that says is everybody blesses in a different way. Not everybody blesses people in the same way. I 
How can we bless our world? How can we bless the people around us? We could, if we wanted to, feed the hungry. We could, if we wanted to, give shelter to the homeless. We, we could, if we wanted to, clothe the needy. We could visit the sick and the imprisoned. We could. A lot of people's objection to that is it takes money, Brother Tim, and I ain't got much. Yeah, I understand. Neither do I. This is this is where this is where my thinking changed. Brother Jones was talking about the need for us to be a blessing. It said that right in Genesis chapter twelve, verse two. It said to Abraham, You are a blessing. We're Abraham's seed. That makes us a blessing. I said, God, I don't got money to hand out willy-nilly to people. But do you understand that blessings don't have to do with money? <laughs> if you have money to bless people, God bless you. Do so. Because there's a need for that. But you can bless somebody with a kind word. When the whole world's beating them down, you can say, hey, you know what? God loves you, and because He loves you, I love you. Nobody else believes in you, but you know what? God does. And because He does, I do. We can bless people by accepting them. By welcoming, welcoming them in. Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. What everybody thought was the lowest of the low, Jesus welcomed them into his presence. He's, he shared bread with them. He ate with them. We need to be accepting the people. Brother Tim, they might be a bad influence. I don't find anything in Scripture that Jesus met them at the door and said, Excuse me, are you going to be a bad influence? He said, No, just come on in. You could bless somebody with a hug. You could bless somebody with a ride. You could bless somebody with a helping hand. It doesn't take money to bless people. Matthew 5, verse 43. I want you guys to get this. I want you to understand. You need to be a blessing. But we have a tendency. We have a tendency. This this right here is exactly our tendency. You have heard it said. You've heard that it was said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus, I have no problem at all blessing brother and sister Regan. No problem at all. I have no problem at all blessing you know, uh, brother and sister Whitley. I have no problem. But Jesus, when I said, but I say to you, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Skip down to verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors, do not even the lowest of the low, do not even the sinners do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. So let me break this down for you. God wants you to be a blessing. And he wants you to be a blessing to people who don't deserve for you to be a blessing to them. He wants you to be a blessing whether you think they need it or not. He wants you to be a blessing whether they're grateful or not. He wants you to be a blessing whether they learn the lesson or they don't. He just wants you to be a blessing. We're the ones that start qualifying things. We're the ones that say, I, I'll, I'll, I, I, well, I'm going to help that person again. They never said thank you. I missed that verse. You'll have to show me that verse where it says help people as long as they say thank you. No, it says bless people. It says be a blessing. 
I said I was going to say this, so I'm going to go ahead and say it because the person I said I was going to say it to is here. So We have a tendency to be Facebook Christians. When that picture of Jesus comes by, we type amen and we share it. That may bless a few, but it's not really blessing anybody. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably the world's worst Facebook Christian because I never type amen or share any of those. But I may still be a Facebook Christian if all I ever do is talk. If all I ever do is talk, you know what I am then? I'm a hypocrite. I'm pretending. I I I am not perfect. I, I know y'all know that. You, you you've seen me make mistakes. I am not perfect. This is the target. This is what we aim to be. But if you want to be something, you got to get up and you got to try. Because if all you do, I may step on some toes, I'm sorry. If all you do is read your Bible and that does not motivate you to change and be a blessing, then there is something missing somewhere. Jesus came to do more than read the word. He even came to do more than preach the word. He got out there and he worked. And he physically did things. What I'm trying to leave you with, what I'm trying to challenge you with tonight, is to find something, somewhere. This is where it changed my, my thinking. This is where it changed my praying. I started praying, Lord, help me find somebody to bless today. I can't walk up to somebody and give them a hundred dollar bill. But I might be able to find something I can do that can make somebody's life easier. I may find some way to be kind to someone. I might, I might have an encouraging word. I, I can do that. I'd encourage you to find somebody to bless this week. They do not need to meet a qualifying exam. <laughs> Other than, do they have a need? That's, that's the only thing you need to know. When we start basing whether we help people on whether or not they're going to come to church, we've missed the boat. Pastor keeps talking about getting back to that first century church. Do you know what they were known for? They were known for giving kindness when no one else would. When the plagues struck, it was the Christians that went out and tended the sick. And I'd like to say that they were all safe. But many of them also caught the plague and died. They didn't care. They did it anyway. Because they wanted to be a blessing. While, while, their, while their society was running away, and ostracizing those that were sick. It was the Christians that were going in and taking care of them. When the Romans would leave babies on the side of the river, because that was what they did with the child that they didn't want, the Christians would come out of the catacombs at night. This is when they were forced to live in catacombs. So, you know, they're not, they're not wealthy. They're not having lots of this worldly goods. History says they would come out of the catacombs and they would take those babies and take them back and raise them as their own. Did they have the funds to do that? No, probably not. Did they have the food to do that? No, probably not. But they saw a need and they filled it. Be a blessing. If you are in Christ, you are part of Abraham's seed. And if you are part of Abraham's seed, and according to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, you are a blessing. 
So bless somebody. However, how, whatever form that takes, however you can, bless somebody. Can we bow our heads here today? Jesus, you are going to show somebody to us. You are going to give us a need to meet. You are going to guide us, Lord God, to people who need to be blessed. So I ask you, God, to strengthen us as well to do what needs to be done. Give us wisdom and courage to be the blessing that you intend us to be. In Jesus' name. Be a blessing to somebody. Uh, Brother James, do you have an offering back this morning? Y'all are dismissed in Jesus' name. If you have an offering, please see Brother James Johnson. Did you? I'm sorry, did you have something to say, Brother? Okay. All right. God bless you. Find somebody to bless this week. However you can.